Oh, Comic-Con 2015. Warner Brothers made so many jaw-dropping promises only to botch them entirely in the edit. That first trailer for Suicide Squad was magnetic. It's one of the few trailers that I revisit after all of these years and still fills me with the same excitement, emotions, and chill-inducing feeling I got when I watched it for the first time. I, like many others, obsessively watched that trailer on repeat for weeks, months, hell, even probably a whole year leading up to the first theatrical outing for The Suicide Squad. It remains one of the best pieces of movie marketing. The grit, the haunting music, the dark and eerie tone, and then we got the movie... Don't hurt me. I'll be your friend. Oh. Suicide Squad, what went wrong here? Why was the first movie so bad? Is it David Ayer's fault? Well, not exactly. Warner Brothers, apparently needing to prove to the world that they know better than the creators they hire time and time again, butchered Suicide Squad the same way that they ruined Zack Snyder's Justice League, altering and chopping up Ayer's version of the film to the point where it's hard to tell what scenes, if any, are actually his handiwork, or just his footage sloppily slapped together by another team. What resulted is a positively excruciating viewing experience that was rightly panned even by DCEU defenders and, to the other side of the coin, even people who hated other DCEU entries frequently shows up at the bottom of any DCEU ranking you can find out there. It's pretty damn near miraculous that something like Birds of Prey, being a sequel-ish spin-off to such a widely reviled film, managed to not only find an audience, but downright impress most of the same people who trashed that 2016 film. And while Harley Quinn is the best thing about that original film, she's still kind of a mess of a character in it. Of course, Birds of Prey did a lot of course correction for Harley, but it still left a lot more on the table as far as the rest of the Suicide Squad were concerned. And that's fair. After all, Birds of Prey is more of a Harley Quinn film than it is a true Suicide Squad sequel. In any case, Harley's been fixed, but where do you go from there in order to get a new film out of these characters? What does it take to, ahem, <clears throat> squad up? And more importantly, what needs to be changed in order to do it right this time? Well, I think the first and most important thing to do is look at what the Suicide Squad is, who they are, and what it is about their story that necessitates the big screen treatment. The Suicide Squad, of course, is DC's iconic team of anti-heroes and villains who, after being imprisoned, are brought together to perform Black Ops missions in order to earn reduced sentences or even outright parole. Of course, some of its more iconic members, Harley Quinn, Dead Deadshot, Killer Croc, and Captain Boomerang, just to name a few, are nigh indestructible mainstays, but as the name implies, the team are sent on literal suicide missions, and while they often succeed, there's still a high turnover of disposable characters who don't make it through a single mission. Cannon fodder, as chief creator John Ostrander once referred to them. More than that, they're an allegory for the outcasts, the left behind, those who have suffered injustices. Not all of these characters are villains or evil, and even a commentary on the failure that is the prison industrial complex. That's worked great in the comics, but you can't just take those characters and ideas, take a bunch of scenes depicting them, put them in a blender, and then release it as a film the way Warner Brothers did with David Ayer's work. So what do you change the second time around? Well, first, you've soured your relationship with the artist you originally worked with, so you instead have to find a new visionary who can build something with this IP. Enter James Gunn. The genius who stared the entire horror genre in the face and kicked it deep into the 21st century with Slither, who brought the Guardians of the Galaxy to the big screen in an explosive way. In fact, that MCU entry works almost as a dry run for some of the thematic and character requirements that a proper Suicide Squad movie needs. Gunn has a deep-seated empathy for outcasts, for finding heroism in the abstract or even the absurd. Quill, Rocket, and Gamora might not necessarily be murderous psychopaths or reviled criminals, but they're definitely outcasts of a type. I think what separates this movie in a lot of ways from the Guardians of the Galaxy is that when we go in with those main Guardians at the beginning, we know that those are all, they're probably good guys. In the first movie, when Rocket uh, is gonna says he's gonna shoot Drax's face off, we don't think that maybe you know Rocket is really. We're not gonna see Drax's face get shot off two seconds later. 
Yeah. However, in this movie, when a character says that they might kill another person, they might, and in fact, they do in this movie. Peter Quill is a scavenger. Rocket is a bounty hunter. Gamora, while the daughter of a murderous psychopath, doesn't necessarily agree with her father's archaic beliefs, but yet is still roped in with him in his wickedness. They find one another through circumstances larger than themselves and create an unlikely family. Family dynamics permeate James Gunn's two Guardians films and craft serious discussions about what makes family. Discussions that are so tangible and real that, by comparison, they make Dominic Toretto look like a guy who just over-exaggerates his relationship with a bunch of acquaintances of his. Gunn might hold a tight grip on parenthood and the effect of literal blood family, but he just as importantly examines how a group of people, all from different backgrounds and with no prior relation to one another, can create a family of their own. I believe in the dignity of human beings. I believe in that there's worth to every human life. And, um, and so I come into that filmmaking with that belief. Gunn has a proven track record of taking iconic pieces of pop culture, whether it be Marvel IPs or entire genres of film, modernizing them, adding his style and voice to them, and taking audiences on a gripping journey with them. Now, granted, with the State of the Suicide Squad IP on film, there's pretty much nowhere to go but up. But merely making a better film than what we got in 2016 isn't enough for James Gunn. Any pedestrian director could probably create something moderately compelling if you threw Warner Brothers kind of money at them and had it in your contract to not allow them to hack your creative vision to shit. No, James Gunn took it upon himself to create a legendary comic book movie, ripping the Suicide Squad right off the pages and maximizing them to their full potential, just as he did with the Guardians of the Galaxy in 2014. What we get is the Suicide Squad, which is a definitive portrayal of these characters to such an extent that you can pretty much just start with this film and never look back again. It's a testament to James Gunn. It's why he's become such a sought-after filmmaker now, practically the Steven Spielberg of Grindhouse and, in a lot of ways, modern blockbuster action cinema. The Suicide Squad contains all of Gunn's calling cards. It has an incredibly dark humor that permeates every scene, ramps up the violence to levels we haven't seen from him since Slither or Super, and yet builds a wholesome and realistic emotional core around the action and gore. These characters finally feel human, not just because the actors punch above their weight like Margot Robbie did five years ago, but because the script gets there before a single frame was shot. Gunn's films always have a deep connection to family and parenthood, and The Suicide Squad is no exception. But it also functions as a vessel for Gunn to let his career frustrations loose in the wake of a Twitter scandal with Marvel that we're not going to waste too much time on because thankfully the situation was rectified, but which pushed him at the time into making this film. James Gunn is a good person. He's a genuine human being who used to make dumb, edgy decisions and jokes on Twitter. The Suicide Squad aren't all monsters. Some of them are also good people who have made bad choices, or people whose circumstances or abusive and manipulative upbringings left permanent scars, which Gunn himself can actually relate to firsthand. Getting awful honest now, but I had a lot of abuse in my childhood, and that was something that I had to deal with to become more fully who I really am. And uh, I did that through therapy. I did that through becoming vulnerable and sharing with my friends. And in a way, that's what we see these characters doing. They've all had childhood traumas. They've all had things that they've had to deal with as adults. And being able to deal with that stuff and share with each other, when Bloodsport shares his story with Ratcatcher 2, they are then able to heal one another. Just like the squad, James has experienced the darkness and light that lives in all humans. It's a deep connection between the filmmaker's humanity and the humanity of the characters in the film, and the latter is broadly strengthened by the former. In a lot of ways, more than for how much fun his films are, this is why James Gunn was the perfect choice to give this franchise a fresh start. Let's talk about family. Despite their expendability, the Suicide Squad's strength is in the name, Squad. 
There's a camaraderie built by the experience of their missions themselves, an intertwining set of relationships that develop as the film goes on and they spend more time together. The characters don't just try and achieve their original personal goals. As the story progresses, they're in it for one another as well. The thing that I really loved about Ostrander's original series is it was Black Ops books, you know, about these characters who were being used by the government because they were considered disposable and that no one would miss them if they died and no one would make a fuss if they were killed in the line of action mm -hmm. for used on missions where they were most likely going to die. And that's what this, that's that's the central like idea I took from John Ostrander's original Suicide Squad books into this movie. When the suicide in Suicide Squad comes to fruition, where earlier in the film it may have been shrugged off by the characters, by the end, it affects them deeply. I mean, hell, there's a fucking massacre at the start of this thing that makes it crystal clear how unimportant these people are to the government powers that control them. There, There's a lot of loss here. There's a lot of people who are not able to connect because of their time is cut short or because they just aren't able to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, you know, one of the things. It's like some of these characters are redeemable and some of them are pretty close to being irredeemable. Bloodsport anchors the team while Amanda Waller holds his literal family hostage. In the process, he forms a second family with the people he's on a mission with. No one gets there quickly or easily, but as they go through this together, they learn to understand one another, care for one another, and fight for one another. We don't really know who is going to end up showing some heart at the end. We don't know who's going to die. We don't know who's going to live. And it is exactly those stakes that make it so exciting for me to tell this story. Or look at Ratcatcher and King Shark's dynamic, which starts off as Killer Shark literally tries to eat her. Ratcatcher's response is not by way of violence, but by way of compassion and friendship. Shark then goes on to not try and do that again to any members of the team because he comes to trust them and care for them. They're his friends, they're his family. Ratcatcher creates a different kind of bond with Bloodsport, she loved her dad and was deeply close with him. Bloodsport, on the other hand, actively tried to be a neglectful deadbeat so as to discourage his kid from following his ways. Ratcatcher, using lessons her own father taught her about the value of life, reaches out to Bloodsport, recognizing him for what he is, a misguided person who's ultimately good at heart and worth fighting for. This is Bloodsport we're talking about. He's so set in the notion that he doesn't deserve love or redemption that he just doubles down on being a hitman since what else is there to lose? Ratcatcher sees through that to the human being, to the friend, to the family member that lies underneath. As a writer and a director, having compassion for each of their, those characters, even the characters that are considered villains, is, is important. And another added layer is that Bloodsport is terrified of rats, particularly rat catchers, because of a traumatic event from his childhood. But he learns that rats can be just as capable and compassionate as any human, and so he finds a way to coexist. It's the entire dynamic of the characters in the movie boiled down to a single subplot. Gunn keeps his ideas and his character work consistent no matter what scale they're applied to. But all the characters were really fun. If I'm not having fun writing a character and, and really finding their voice, I'll cut them out of the script. I won't put them in there. And to that end, the nature of what the squad are doing, what they're fighting for, has a similar impact that was sorely missed in the earlier film. While the morally gray nature of the US government and Amanda Waller were previously examined at a superficial level, Gunn's film directly confronts and calls into question the morality of the team's missions. It's not so much authority figures bending the rules and enlisting villains this time, so much as it is Waller and company making you question which side of this arrangement are actually villains. They're sending the squad in to do their dirty work and cover up their involvement, plus steal classified information that condemns the US's involvement with Starro. The film flips the script and the bureaucracy becomes the villain. While something like Starro is a victimized force of nature who's only acting like an animal backed into a cage because of how his handlers treated him. The squad become the heroes because they disobey orders of tyrants. 
the U.S. government couldn't care less about the people of Corto Maltese, playing into U.S. interventionalism and how they only involve themselves for their own gain or to preserve their image, and leaves the place worse off than where they were before. The squad acts against that, showing that even these so-called worthless lives, expendable criminals, are capable of good, are morally empathetic and human, especially in the face of phony patriotism and the bureaucracy. It's a story forged in the fire of anger and fury as the Trump administration, and hopefully the peak of Trumpism itself, enters its dying, gasping, insurrection-attempting twilight. This is the Dirty Dozen, except rather than being sent in to destroy the Nazis' field headquarters and deal a massive blow to their war effort, the film asks us, could the enemy this time instead be the side sending our main characters into battle? It's a great anti-establishment twist, and when you combine it with Harley Quinn as one of the protagonists and audience surrogate of the film who is being courted for her anti-American fervor, and the way she sticks a middle finger to the man at any given opportunity, it's punk rock as fuck! This is also emphasized with the film's soundtrack and even its tagline, they're dying to save the world. The villains of yesterday might just be the heroes of tomorrow, and more pertinently, the opposite is also happening, and so it needs to be stopped. The juxtaposition of sending Waller and the government further into the depths of villainy while properly humanizing the Suicide Squad emphasizes a dichotomy that exists between cynicism and sentimentality. It contrasts something grotesque, abusive, manipulative governments with something beautiful, the bond of the Suicide Squad. This kind of plays out visually as well, with Gunn's usual vibrant and gorgeous visual style contrasting gory dismemberments and bloodbath action sequences and Gunn's willingness to dive deep into the worst facets of humanity makes it all the more cathartic and effective when we get to see flashes of the things that make us, as humans, the best we can be. It's a reinvention of the way the Suicide Squad was portrayed in Ayer's film, but it's also kind of a reimagined portrayal from anything we've seen in the comics as well. Gunn tweaks the emotional and psychological nuances that his screenplay focuses on to great effect. This might actually be the most human that we've ever seen the Suicide Squad. Even someone like Rick Flagg, who was just a throwaway, two-dimensional government grunt in the first film, finds his character altered for the better, to the point where he might even find his footing as a fan favorite for what he brings to the table in The Suicide Squad. It's exciting for me to see Rick and Joel getting a lot of love as, as people see this movie, because he is one of the few characters in the movie who has good intentions. Mm -hmm. and. Seeing that play out, I think we, we sort of fall in love with him. He doesn't have, he's not as like holy or innocent as Ratcatcher 2 is, but he's, can, it's even, he's more admirable than that because he's kept on to his beliefs despite kind of being through a lot with those beliefs. Hell, in a movie with so many colorful and eccentric characters to latch onto, I found myself shocked that the character I was invested in the most was Rick Flagg in Joel Kinnaman's portrayal. The same could be said for Harley Quinn, but honestly, she was the single best thing about the original film to begin with and Birds of Prey made improvements of its own towards her. So it's not really a surprise that James Gunn would close the gap and craft a script that plays off of her growth, her progression, where we left her at the end of Birds of Prey, where Harley becomes fully realized as the great character she has and always will be. No, I actually think Harley would be a terrible hero to have in real <laughs> life. I mean, I love, I love Harley. Yeah. I love her as a character, but she is, the trickster, she's chaos personified, and she's crazy. Um, and so we get to see her grow a little bit in this this movie. We get mm. to see her making some quote unquote healthy choices that to her are very healthy. But if that was a real person, they certainly wouldn't be that healthy. They're just healthy in comparison to who Harley is and where she's coming from. We get to see her show a little bit more humanity in certain ways that she hasn't seen before. and that we haven't seen from her. And I, and I like that, you know, but she's still a trickster at the end of the day. Man, the Suicide Squad just works. James Gunn has successfully rebuilt this IP from the ground up, giving us the Suicide Squad movie we should have gotten five years ago. In a just sane world, this would be Gunn's second Suicide Squad movie. 
That being said, there's got to be at least one sequel to this. It's a great film, but what makes the movie tick? What makes it the definitive portrayal of these characters? What makes it such a risky venture, and in what ways do those risks pay off? Sure, the film takes a healthy helping from Tarantino and Grindhouse cinema. Sure, it can be a bloodbath at times. It can be crude. It can be mean and nasty. It can be fucking bonkers. While that's a little risky for a big-budget super superhero film, I think movies are generally at a point where audiences can not only accept, but actively want such unfiltered action. There's more going on here. The Suicide Squad isn't afraid to create real stakes for its characters and explore the actual ramifications of those stakes, but more importantly, there's just a lot of fun going on here as well. I generally in my hip past have not liked making movies, as strange as that sounds. I loved writing and storyboarding and creating the films, and I love editing movies, and I have not liked shooting movies. It's just been very, very difficult, and this movie was the first movie I actually had fun making. That in and of itself could sum it up. The Suicide Squad isn't supposed to just be dour, nihilistic chaos. It's supposed to still be fun as well. Morbid, twisted, macabre fun, sure, but fun nonetheless. It is so fun, it is so over the top, it is so yeah. violent, it's so bloody, but there are characters that we really connect to and who connect to each other. Finally, the team behind a Suicide Squad movie understood this and figured it out. And as a result, we get James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, the definitive Suicide Squad film, and one of the best films DC has ever done. And if I'm being honest, it might just be James Gunn's masterpiece. Maybe James Gunn has successfully kicked off another groundbreaking era for DC. It'd sure be nice to see, at least.